into the night Wanting a place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones And I try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond Just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me that I was not alone Because he picked me up He turned me around Placed my feet on solid ground I thank the Master I thank the Savior Because he healed my heart He changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior I thank God I cannot deny what I've seen Got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friend Burning and bitterness, you can just keep it moving. No, you ain't welcome here. For now till I walk the streets of gold, I sing about you save my soul. This wayward son has found its way back home. Cause you pick me up. Because he healed my heart, he said my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior I thank God He'll lost another one I am free, I am free, I am free He'll lost another one I am free I am free, I am free. They lost another one. I am free, I am free, I am free. They lost another one. I am free, I am free, I am free. Because he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. Because he healed my heart, changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior I thank God
Good morning and welcome to Independent Sunday. Please join us in response. Great is the Holy One who sits sovereign and near. The earth rejoices on the holy mountain at the heights and depths of God's love. We gather, we observe, we recognize, we ponder the wonders of Creator's majesty. The mighty deeds of power about astound and amaze. We remember, reaccount from generation to generation. Our God reigns forever and ever. Praise our God. Our opening prayer. Powerful one, we come into the gathering humbled by your presence among us, grateful for your companionship of your people, and eager to worship your name and tell your story anew. We enter your story as objects of your attention, love, and care. May we know you more deeply and clearly. May we be transformed and tree-fixed by your mystery of you. May we be inspired by your deeds of power to be instruments of your reign in the world. Empower us, O Holy One. Amen. Good morning, church. It is good to see everybody this week. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed your 4th of July Thursday. Uh, and I'm glad, so glad that you made, you know, worship a part of your uh, 4th of July weekend. Uh, as always, I pray that uh, by the time you leave today, something happens that you say, man, I'm glad I came to church this morning. I'm going to invite the young worshipers to meet uh, Carol Kerman. She's going to meet you in the back of the church. She's got some amazing things planned for you this morning. And uh, so you are dismissed at this time. want to just say that, you know, whether you've been worshiping with us for, uh, for a while, uh, maybe you're joining us for one of the very first times, or you're joining us online, that we're just grateful to have you here today. 
Got a couple of announcements to share. We're going to start off with Vacation Bible School, which uh, yep. gets just, started in a week. Yep, that's just around the corner. Um, still time to sign up. Um, youth potty trained basically through um, just finished fifth grade. Um, anything older than that, then if you'd like to be a volunteer, please let me know. Um, we are really excited. We have finally uh, supplies available outside. There are some little um, animal tags, CE animal tags out there. Um, unfortunately, I did not leave a lot of time to get those items. So um, if you could return them by this Wednesday, perfect. If you can return them next Sunday at the latest, perfect. Um, we would love to know that we have those provided um, in the blue tubs. Um, as you enter, there's a few for a new mission project, and there's a few that are marked for Vacation Bible School. Um, just pick up a few of those animals on your way out. Um, we have started a um, new adult ed Bible study between services from about 1010 10 till, well, I just walked in. Um, we, we try to cut it off, on Proverbs. Um, and it's just kind of, um, the book of Proverbs is all about um, what would you like to tell the youth about wisdom and righteousness um, as they're growing. That's what the book is intended for. As they're growing into their faith and making decisions in life, uh, this is the wisdom that we would impart on them. But it's good probably for uh, the more mature, I think it said seasoned, audience as well. So um, anybody who'd like to come to that between services starting at 10, 10. Um, I think I have another one. Oh, yes, our next overseas mission trip. Um, we're going to have some more trivia because it's National S'mores Day on August 10th, Saturday. Um, all of it will be a fundraiser um, for the next overseas trip, which we're planning to go to Peru. Um, and um, you can start to sign up tables or individuals um, through me or through the office um, if you are available and interested. It was a really fun night last time. We'll have a s'more bar um, and some soda and waters available, and you can bring your own foods to share as well. So we hope that you'll consider, um, and if you have donations um, that you'd like to make or sponsor around, um, please see me about that as well. So we, uh, we've started something new. You probably have seen it for the last two weeks. Uh, we've been putting it out on a Thursday. It's a collaborative effort with, uh, with our staff. Um, and it's called the Thursday Thread. So we've kind of have heard some uh, advice uh, from parishioners. We, we, we do put out a lot of communications in a week. And so what we uh, decided to do, you know, Kyle initially came up with the idea. The whole format is all Natalie. It is wonderful uh, because when you click on it, you, everything ha uh, each piece has a heading. So you can quickly go through there and see, okay, I need, I'd like to find out about that, that, and that, and then be able to click on that. Uh, so if you, it's kind of like a weekly digital newsletter that you'll get. We will still have prayer concerns that go out on Tuesday, but then this is going to go out on Thursday, and it's, a, and it's an attempt to uh, cut down on all of the constant contacts that you get one communication every Thursday, and it came out on time this week, even though it was a holiday, because we can set the time automatically for it to just come out uh, whenever we wanted to. So the Thursday thread, um, every Thursday... Uh, just share with you with all of the stuff that's going on at St. Paul's that you like might like to have an update about. Right. Can we maybe try to have a printed copy or two on Sunday mornings? Sure, we can talk about that in staff yes, meeting. I'm just sure. letting you know. I think that'd sure. be a good idea. Sure, printed printed copies for uh, Sunday mornings. So, um, as we worship together today, it is the weekend of the Fourth of July holiday, and so we come together uh, with the just the celebration of families who have spent time together this weekend, fireworks that are still going on on my neighborhood uh, on a nightly basis. We'll see what tonight brings. <laughs> we just keep celebrating. We just keep celebrating. And so in that vein, I just want to share with you, I know I shared this with you maybe a year or so ago, but uh, a poem written by um, one of our poet laureates right here at St. Paul, Scott Schmidt who's back at the soundboard today, let me share this with you. He writes, I am just one thread in a multicolored flag, 
a flag which represents the United States of America, woven together with so many other threads, threads, each of their own uniqueness and distinction, one with their God, peaceful and just, forming a strength and bond held together with trust and compassion for all, so that their individual goodwill, free mind, spirit, and soul will shine the sun on oppression, slavery, and bondage with a beam of light that will always rise up to a higher horizon of hope. For said sake of all of us around our wonderfully beautiful as well as blessed and bountiful emerald of a planet that we all call home. Share this extraordinary creation with a praise of a higher power for giving us all a wondrous world to worship and celebrate faith, hope, peace, and love, giving life a true meaning of joy. God in heaven, Lord of justice for all, we turn to you today on this Independence Day Sunday. We recall, recall the day when our country claimed its place among the families of all nations. For all that has been achieved, we give you thanks. For the work that still remains, we ask your help. And as you have called us from many peoples, guide us to be the one nation. Help us to continue the good works begun long ago. Make our vision clear and our will strong in Congerges. This only in human fidelity will we behold liberty and justice belonging to every life on earth. You reveal that those who work for peace will be called your sons and daughters. We want to strive to be your sons here on earth and your daughters who are strong and faithful. Through the power and working of your Holy Spirit, you call us to live out our faith in the midst of this world, bringing the light and the saving truth of the gospel. In the very last corner of the earth, please continue to send your spirit to touch the hearts and minds of all who cherish the lights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As you have called us to be one nation, granted that under your providence, our country may share your blessings with all the people on earth. We humbly ask you to bless us in our efforts and in our diligence. For the gift of religious liberty, give us the strength of mind, heart, and soul to readily defend our freedom when they are threatened. Give us the courage and the making of our voices heard on behalf of the right of your church and the freedom of conscience of all people of faith. We ask this through the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you as we pray together the prayer that God has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So uh, we find ourselves today in, uh, it, it's the second letter uh, or, or, or second attributed letter that Paul writes to the people at Corinth. It's 2 Corinthians. He actually writes four letters to the Corinthians overall. But this comes at a time where um, Paul is getting word back that there is some division among the people. Uh, that they're dealing with some rough stuff. And it's not necessarily from the outside, but within. And so he writes this to give them some encouragement and some perspective that comes out of his own life. And so I invite you to just uh, read along with me on the screens uh, as I share with you uh, out of the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians uh, verses 2 to 10. I know, a man, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. 
And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. He was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God's word for God's people. I love this passage because it is so relatable. You know, the first like four verses that I read, Paul's talking in the third person, but he's really ta- he's talking about himself. You know, it's like me saying, uh, Mike likes you. Mike would like to do something fun with you maybe later on. Can you and Mike talk sometime? He's talking about himself, but he's careful in how he shares it because he he wants to use himself as an example, but he doesn't want to make it about him. In other words, he doesn't want to boast about what he has gone through. Paul is talking about himself in the third person, and we know that by this time, that it's at least 14 years removed from the con- uh, from Paul's conversion when he is headed over to Damascus. And so, Paul, 14 years before, he's headed to Damascus. He's going to talk to church leaders. He knows where a bunch of Christians are, and he wants to have. Uh, the authority to go and to arrest them and to persecute them. And along this road, along to Damascus, he has an encounter with Jesus Christ. He goes blind for a while. He has this divine experience and everything changes on that fateful day. That had been 14 years ago, but Paul's talking about it on this day when he's talking about, I know a man. 14 years ago. He was caught up to the third heaven. Now that sounds kind of odd too, doesn't it? But he's trying to share his experience in a way that the hearers will understand. You see the temple and before that the tent of the holiest of holies was divided into three areas. There was the place that the common people could come to. And then the next area would have been the, pre- people, uh, the place that the, 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 the priests would have been able to go to. But then the third place, the holiest of holies, the place where they... Uh, kept the Ark of the Covenant, there was one person who was allowed to go into that third tent, that most holy of holies. And so he divides heaven into these three areas too. And he wants to give this image, this understanding that God allowed him for them to meet together in this third heaven, in this holiest of holies to change his life around and to bring a message to them. He wants to bring some authority, but he doesn't want to make it all about himself. And see, so he starts off as if he's talking about someone else. And what he has to share with us is so relatable and so powerful. So I have three things that I want you to I want to share with you today. And the first is this, is that in verses 6 through 8, Paul talks about this thorn... That he's been afflicted with. A thorn in my flesh. You see. Paul wants. Again to relate to you. That there's something big that he's dealt with. Most of his life. At least most of his ministry. And it hasn't gone away. 
you know, you can read all kinds of commentary about this because scholars have speculated for centuries about what that thorn in the flesh might have been. We know because Paul never got married that maybe it was temptation. Maybe there was some special person who was pursuing him. We don't know that. Some say maybe he had something like epilepsy or seizures. Others say it might have had something to do with his eyesight because on the way to Damascus, remember, he's blinded. All I know is that on a Sunday like this, I'm glad that he doesn't tell us because all we can do is speculate. And here's why I'm glad that he doesn't tell us is because every one of us here, somewhere in our world, has a thorn in our flesh. Instead of focusing on what Paul was dealing with, He leaves it for all of us today to just speculate about, but he really wants us to think about our own. You know, for some people, a thorn in our side or a thorn in our flesh, it's a person. Or maybe it's a small group of people. Maybe it's some family members. Maybe it's a group of people. All I know is that, you know, the Corinthian church at this time feels a little bit divided. You know, and he wants to bring some unity to him. Does that feel relatable to our world right now? Oh my goodness, I'm going to admit it. You know, the upcoming election is a thorn in my flesh. Some people think, you know, the thorn in your flesh might be something medical. Maybe it's something you were born with or that you've had to deal with your whole life. And you know that there is no way that there's anything that doctors can do to, to take that away. Maybe you've been dealing with it your whole life. It's become a part of who you are. But maybe there's still a part of you that wish, man, if I just didn't have to have dealt with that. Maybe it's a new diagnosis. Everybody's got something that they're dealing with. And Paul doesn't want you to concentrate on what he's dealing with. He wants you to think about your own life. And so here's how he responds, you know, because he, he, he wants to be relatable. He wants to use himself as an example. But even though he wants to relate, he doesn't want to boast. And so he says, you, you got a thorn in your flesh. First of all, you know, you, you've you got to own that. You know, maybe it's an addiction. Good grief. You know, we have all kinds of 12-step programs for all kinds of things. You know, alcohol and drugs and uh, 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 overeaters. And, but let me tell you what. There's a bunch of addictions that there's no 12-step step program for. Maybe you're a workaholic. That can be an addiction in itself. Or your whole world is wrapped up about, around money. You know, there's not necessarily a 12-step group that meets on a weekly basis that, that deals with that. But that can be an addiction. But Paul says that if, if, you, if you own the thorn in your flesh, most likely you have very little power to get rid of it. Because Paul prays. He says three times. He says, three times I prayed for you to take this away. And how does God answer? God says uh, that my grace is sufficient. If you don't hear anything else from this morning, I want you to take those three words with you. Because we carry the thorn in our flesh. We oftentimes have very little power to get rid of it. But God wants to speak into your life and say, but my grace is sufficient. See, God never promises that he's going to take away that thorn. What he does say is that he's going to give you everything that you need to deal with it. And he says, my grace is sufficient. Maya, I'm, 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 I'm fortunate enough to be married to someone who... Um, has a lot of skills in areas that I struggle with. So for those of you who don't know, Erica went to to college, to undergraduate school, on a full ride in math. 
I mean, her friends were like from the Big Bang Theory, you know. She can also discuss biology, chemistry. You know, she changed her major five times before she decided to go to seminary. I'm not going to say that math and science was a thorn in my flesh, but I'm not at her level. But there are some things that I remember. I remember probably because of the way the professor chose to relate the lesson for the day. And one lesson I will always remember is the law of the pendulum. There's a physical law that speaks to how pendulums work. You know that little thing that goes back and forth, back and forth, uh, like in a grandfather clock? The law of the pendulum says that a pendulum can never return to a point that is higher than the point from which it was released without adding more energy. So you put a weight on the end of a string and you release it and it will continue to make an arc but it will never go past the point from which it started without adding more energy to it. And there's a whole lot of reasons for this. Other laws of nature that revolve around friction and gravity. But to understand this is to believe that if, if, if you take a pendulum, when it spin, spins, uh, uh, swings back towards you, uh, it will always fall short of the original release point. And as it swings, the arc will continue over time to get smaller and smaller until it finally stops. So I, I remember I was a freshman in college. I remember uh, the day that I walked into class. There was probably like 50 of us in there. And the professor is explaining these basic laws and, and the law of the pendulum. And the one thing that you noticed when you came in, and I don't know how he, he, he got up that tall, but he had attached a rope to the ceiling, and at the end of the rope, he tied a brick. And he said, okay, we've just learned these laws I'm going to ask for, and he called out someone's name. It was, once again, she was a freshman just like me. She came up, and, and he's going to demonstrate this law. And he had her, her stand up in front of the class. And so, man, she is, you can tell she's nervous. She's sweating. You know, she's standing there, and he takes this brick on this rope and holds it right up to her nose, and he releases it. Now, that pen, now the law says... That if the pendulum swings, it will not go past the point from which it started. So her only job was to stand there as still as possible and not move. So he releases this brick. It, put, it, it does this huge arc because he, he, he has her up on a stool, by the way, to make the arc bigger. What do you think she did when it came back towards her? What would you do? Yeah, you, she ducked. I mean, who wants to get hit by a brick? But the law said that it should never have hit you. It, 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 obviously, it was a powerful enough demonstration that I remember that class and I remembered that law. Now, if all of my math teachers and science teachers could have done stuff like that, I probably could have done better. You see, that's the problem. It's easy to believe in this law when it's simply a theory, when you're just talking about it, like we're talking about things right now. Yet when your life depends on this law of the pendulum, it shows a lack of faith and belief in the foundation of the, fear, the, the, foundation of the theory itself. You see, fear can also lead us to question science, just like fear causes us to question our faith. Now you say, what in the world does this have to do with our reaction to grace? Well, is it not true that it is easy for us to believe in God's sufficient grace for you and me on Sunday mornings or at the Bible study people just left or when you're having a spiritual conversation? Oh, how is easy it is for us this morning to stand up and say, oh, I rely on God. God's grace is sufficient. I know this thorn in my side. I'm going to give it all over. I can rely on God fully and completely. I trust God with everything. Yet, what happens when we are outside of the church? What happens when things that 
don't go like we planned and they become a thorn in our flesh? What happens when sickness or sorrow or difficulties come into our life? What happens when God says, my grace is sufficient for you, now trust me? What can easily happen is we let go. We run from the brick. We don't want it to hit us. We don't trust the theory when it's actually put into practice. And yet God says that's all you need. I'm not going to promise that I'm going to take it away, but I'm going to give all that you need which is sufficient to deal with it. So take heart. I mean, we read about it, we believe it in theory, but oh my goodness, it gets a lot more scary when we are called to put it into practice. All of us have a thorn that might not ever be taken away, but all of us are given the sufficient grace to deal with whatever is in our life. And then there's this, there's this last verse near the end that I find so powerful. Paul says that power is made perfect in our weakness. If we find it in verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Power in weakness, it just doesn't seem to make sense, but yet it makes all the sense in the world. I don't know if you ever, because it's, it's been a while since it's been out, but ever watched the movie Schindler's List? Long movie. But I will tell you, there was an exact point that was the most powerful for me. So Oscar Schindler and Amon, he's the uh, commandant uh, of the concentration camp. They're sitting out on his balcony. Amon had been drinking quite a bit at that time, but they're having this conversation. And he, Amon is, is telling Oscar Schindler, you know, I have all of this power over them because they're scared of me. I hold their life in my hands. And so Oscar Schindler takes a moment to challenge him. And he said, that's not power. That's vengeance. You know, if, if, if you are controlling somebody out of fear, that's not power at all. Power is when someone commits an act, even if they are guilty, and you pardon them. Now, I remember there's this moment after they have this time on the balcony where Amon is looking at himself in a mirror and he's practicing how that would go if he actually lived through, if he actually followed through on that. And he's looking at himself and he's holding his hand up and I pardon you, I pardon you, I pardon you. And if you remember what happens next, he, he, he can't go through it. He goes out back out to his balcony and he picks up a rifle and he start, starts shooting prisoners indiscriminately out in the courtyard. But that's real power. When we have the ability to do something but choose to do something different because our faith guides us in a different direction. And that's what Paul is trying to say. My power has been perfected because of my weakness, not in spite of it. Today, we celebrate another Communion Sunday because God knows that each and every one of us carries with us a thorn in our flesh, something we're trying to overcome, something we're trying to deal with, to remove, yet we have no power to do so. And Paul would want you to say, that's okay. In fact, that's what unifies us because we all have something. But at the table... We learn that grace is sufficient. God gives us all that we need. Here at the table, power can be made perfect even in our weakness. And so this whole passage from Paul's letter, this section ends with these <coughs> words. That is why, for Christ's sake, we can delight in our weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, even in difficulties. For when we are weak, Jesus says, then that is when we are strong. Amen.
Okay, 4th of July, last Thursday, celebrating this weekend. So let me tell you the next thing that we're preparing to, and that is back to school. So about a month ago, Mission Committee got together as it normally does every month, and um, we started projecting out. And we're working with an organization called Isaiah 58. They have a powerful presence uh, in the inner city. And so they have a program every year, uh, a backpack program. They gather supplies and um, all kinds of things for that back to school uh, experience. And so we went, when we went up uh, on to see what we might sign up for for our congregation this year, we noticed that almost all the churches that were involved, you know, signed up for the stuff that we would think about, like pay, pens, paper, pencils, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But that there was one item that we noticed that nobody signed up for. So we took the challenge. Because there's always things that you don't think about when you're going back to school. You know, like I know a church in the city that has a program where um, they get a whole bunch of uh, hairdressers and barbers in the area for one afternoon and they give uh, kids free haircuts to go back to school. Now think about that. Let's say you're sending three kids back to school or four. How much do you think that co would cost a family just to go get their haircut? And I can tell you that they do not go by volume. Um, it's the same price whether you got a full head of hair or not. I mean, you might fork out probably 50 bucks for three or four kids at least. So another item we don't think about, it's underwear. So that's what we signed up for. We're going to be collecting two, at least a minimum of 250 underwear for uh, uh, kids and, and, and young adults. We got, we're several ways we're going to be able to make this happen. First of all, starting next Saturday, the, the mission committee has pre-bought uh, at least 100 pair. And we're going to have a booth at the market for parishioners. Uh, if, you're, if you happen to be there and you want to just go ahead and do that, you can do that right there. But you'll purchase it. We'll put it in the other bin. But it also is a wonderful outreach to the community because if you're someone who wants to know something about the mission and ministry that St. Paul's is about, it's a great like learning moment. The other thing is, is if you're not and have no, no desire to be a part of, of any community of faith, you still have an opportunity to make a difference in the community that you live in. So we're offering it there. All of the blue bins as you're going into the heritage room have already been relabeled. Uh, uh, and then... Um, August the 5th, we're talking about special days, you know, some more, some more day. Or uh, August 5th is uh, National Underwear Day. That's a Monday. So we are going to designate August 4th as Undies Sunday. So we're, we're looking to get 250 pair back-to-school underwear in our building by August 4th. You can just pray about how you might want to be a part of that, but... Uh, you know, I had a school teacher at the first service as she's leaving. She said, you know, as a school teacher, I just want to thank you for doing that because you have no idea, you know, teachers buy these kind of things to keep in their classroom because they know that kids need it. And it's something that a lot of people don't think about. So um, August 4th, Undies Sunday, uh, bring them in, be proud, because uh, that's what we're going to be about. Hey, we've done toilet paper, might as well do underwear, right? Um, as you think about, uh, you know, the difference that we're making in the community that we're in, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to give. Uh, uh, always the offering plates on the way out. Uh, you can go to sp4u.org if you're an electronic giver, or you can always mail in a donation to the address on your screen. I'm going to invite Norm up, and he's going to bless our, the offering that we're going to take in uh, during this coming week. Creator, we all have imminence from you and your creation. Receive these gifts we give with thanksgiving and hope for the shared future without lack. Disparities and unmet needs, amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes, steal the joy I own. 
When brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I'm Jane no longer has a place to hide. I'm not a captive to the lies. No, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's resurrection break the out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your I just want to welcome Gail back among us after she's been out for a couple of weeks recovering from a surgery. It's great having her. Always add uh, a, a, a bit of yourself to our worship service, and uh, it always fills me when, when we worship together. Being here is part of <laughs> Did you hear that? Being here is part of part of her healing. Um, if you uh, have. Uh, been joining us for the first time or one of the first times we have these envelopes in the pews in front of you, we would love to have you let us know that you were here today. Just fill those out and you can put them um, in the offering plate on the way out. You don't need to put anything inside. There's no expectation about that at all. We're just simply glad that you're here and we hope that you come and join us for worship again very, very soon. Man, I tell you what, you know, when we think about our own afflictions, in that the prayer that we want, you know, man, can't this just go away? But that sufficient grace is what helps us not to let the thorns in our flesh control us. We control it. That grace is sufficient. And that power is made whole in our weakness. 
So I pray if you have heard nothing else to take those three words with you, grace is sufficient. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you, be gracious to you. And may God lift up God's kindness and favor upon you and give you peace. And the mission of St. Paul's is to be a place of worship, refuge, and outreach. Have one great week. God bless.